as someone who's been in in leadership for quite some time, you know, there are certain names that always are associated with excellence. Since I've done done work now almost the past 10 years as a leadership coach and and mentor for many principals in Brooklyn, you cannot cross any bridge and not hear the name of Dr. Lester Young. How's it going, Dr. Young? It's going quite well. And and thank you for that more than more than generous uh, introduction. Thank you for inviting me. Thank you for giving me an opportunity and the space to to just be with you for the time that I can um, and, and to just share with you uh, just a couple of thoughts um, that I have um, as, as someone who's, who's still in the middle of, of the struggle that we all are in to ensure that our young people um, have the education that we all want them to have, but yet for some reason, in spite of what people tell us, it's still not happening. And, and I think the, the message uh, that I would say to everyone is that we're actually in a, in a life and death struggle right now. Um, this, is, this is more than just about, you know, going to school, you know, people talk about this pandemic and what it's done. The truth is, as everyone on this screen knows, the pandemic has just magnified what we've been going through um, for hundreds of years. And, and so the real question becomes, now that it's in our face, what are we prepared to do about it? You know, on, on this screen, there are a lot of people who hold great titles. It's really about what you do while you're in the title. And so what I would say to everyone is that, that my time in this seat is only going to be measured by what we're able to accomplish. Um, and that's to ensure that our young people um, have their birthright to a quality education. One of the things that I wanted to ask you um, was, was exactly exactly what do we plan to do about the technological divide that seems to exist in, uh, in some of these very communities that we serve every single day. Um, we know that we're in a place where I don't think it's going, I don't think technology is gonna go anywhere anytime soon, if ever. Um, so just wanted to kind of just ask that quick question of you is, um, is there anything that we could can do as school leaders well, yeah, I, very practically. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And, and that's a great question. Uh, very practically, as everyone knows, this, this is really a question uh, that has three components, um, courage, will, and resources, right? So, so here, here's the piece. We, we have to ensure that there's the kind of investment in our schools where our children attend to ensure that they have whatever they need, be it devices, See, here, here's where we are. Five years ago, we were probably talking about one thing. Today, we're talking about something else. And I think what we've got to be careful of is that whatever it is our young people need, there needs to be the kind of investment to ensure that that happens. And, and what, what can we do? Um, we can be in touch. Right now, we're in the legislative moment in New York State. And, and for those who, who are in other places, you have your moments of, of the legislative time. But this is the time when we have to challenge the elected leaders to figure out, well, what are the decisions that they're making? Uh, and, and what do I mean by courage and will? Um, for example, in New York State, just as an example, we spend $68,000 a year to keep one child incarcerated. Right? So there's a willingness on the part of our elected leaders to allocate year after year $68,000 per juvenile, per young person, to keep them locked up. And we debate, we allow them to debate whether they're going to spend $13,000 educating young people. Now, now, just, just you know, my saying, it, you know, I'm sure people are saying, well, what am I saying? Here's what I'm saying. No one puts pressure on anyone to challenge that kind of thinking. So, so I think it, this is about will, uh, this is about courage, because we all understand the connection between the juvenile justice system 
and later incarceration and what happens to our young people. And yet we know that if we can give them the benefit of a quality education, they'll never have to go into that system. But yet we, we don't do anything. We don't challenge our elected leaders to figure out better ways to honor and respect and protect our children. Thinking about equity and thinking about culturally responsive education, the exams that our students have before them are often culturally and racially biased. So my request would be, as you serve, to really take a look at the exams. And as we think about the students in New York City, I serve in the Brownest Borough in our city, to think about the exams that are put in front of them, really capturing the experience of students in the city and our students who are upstate. Mm -hmm. Well, great, uh, that, that's a valued recommendation. Just, just to give you a sense of one of the things we've done, uh, we recently held a session um, that included practitioners such as yourself, but we also had high school students there. Um, and the whole purpose of, of this session was for the young people and the practitioners to actually point out um, the, the flaws and the errors and the biases that, that are found in the New York State Regents examinations. And so right now, um, we're going through a process where we're reviewing it for just that, for just that reason. The other, the other thing is uh, that it, it, it's not only in the assessments, it, it's, it's a total absence Absolutely. in the curriculum. So, so part, of, part of what we've got to be cognizant of, it's, it's not only how we assess students, it's also in the content we teach them, it's also in the way we deliver the content. Indeed. So all, all of those things are part of it. Um, be assured of this, uh, you know, we are going to be taking on, on many of these issues. Um, our first task, I'll be quite honest with you, is try to get ourselves through COVID and, and, and get us to a point where we could get back to educating young people in a safe, secure manner. Uh, but as we go about doing that, um, you should be assured that uh, both the board as well as our new commissioner are committed um, to addressing this very issue. I read something from uh, Dwayne The Rock Johnson a couple of days ago, and it says that every man wants a son, but every man needs a daughter. <laughs> and so as a young man, as a man who has a young daughter, I know what it means in terms of being life-changing and things like that. So I just wanted to at least give you the opportunity to come and spend some time with us. And, and again, I know that the work that you've done has been amazing. It's truly been amazing. But I, but I did want to start there with you by having that conversation about the impact that having a daughter has meant to the work that you're doing as an educational leader, author, and everything else. Yeah, thank you very much. And, uh, and I'm actually humbled by the opportunity to to be among uh, this group of uh, educators. I don't know everyone, but I'm sure that uh, the work that you're doing is significant um, and impactful. You know, uh, as it relates to my daughter, yeah, for some reason, whenever I, I think about, uh, this is the first time that it was ever posed the way you just did in terms of bringing it up, so I appreciate that. Uh, when I think about my daughter, uh, for years I've thought about incarceration. You know, you may say, why incarceration? Because I thought that one day I may have to kill somebody for bothering her. And I know that may not be the best thing to say. <laughs> but, um, but I really uh, believe that, you know, my job is in part to prepare her for life and also to be a protector. And um, yeah, so that, that impacted me significantly. Uh, her mother and I, you know, just, uh, we decided when she was in, the, I guess, pre-K to homeschool her. So she's never attended a traditional uh, public or, or private school in that, in that sense. Uh, so, you know, she's a, she's a lifelong learner. She's currently residing in Atlanta. Um, she's a, an entrepreneur. She was an entrepreneur since she could say the word. Um, so I never told her that you're going to become something. You're already that. 
you know, and so that's kind of the philosophy that I've always had for her, as well as, you know, for my, for my students, just to try to encourage them to be the best that they can be. And always seeing in them, seeing her, but as well as seeing myself, you know, um, as a young boy. Um, so yeah, so yeah, I'm very, very proud of her. Uh, she continues to amaze me. Uh, my question was around, you mentioned the work that you're doing in Black history really being at the center of that work. Um, I'm always curious to know, is there any um, initiatives around ensuring that there are standards that govern uh, any um, culture responsive curriculum uh, that ultimately uh, gets put on the table and what what uh, kind of accountability measures are being imagined uh, to hold leaders accountable for the implementation of it at the school level? So, th so there are conversations um, that's happening. However, and and now that you mentioned that, you, you know, you I think you would be a great uh, addition to this conversation, uh, particularly around the, the the standards question, because the the Board of Regents right now they put in a what they call a non um, state aid request um, to fund um, commissions or committees that will look at the creation of standards, the whole issue of assessments, uh, teacher quality, teacher preparation programs, uh, leadership programs in terms of putting these standards in place for leadership programs. And that's sort of like what the, the framework is trying to address. We have not come up with like say, oh, here are the answers to the problem. What we're saying is that these are areas that need to be further explored, right? And we've also partnered with uh, Teachers College. And so they're, they're also working with us around this question of standards. But now the interesting part in New York State is that each district, each district gets to choose its own uh, curriculum, right? So even when we come up with the, uh, let's say the standards, um, but the districts themselves will come up with their own curriculum and, and whether or not this, that curriculum is executed with fidelity is another question because it's not legislative, right? It's not necessarily law. And so we're trying to look at the total, the total picture to figure out how can we ensure that one, we have this uh, work reflected clearly, explicitly in the standards. Two, how do we sort of, you gotta get to this point where it's kind of like, required a mandate right now it's not in the law where it's required for a district that doesn't have any black children or latinx children they can totally ignore uh as long as there's no questions about it being on a test or something like that right so they can totally ignore it uh so we're trying to look that's where the legislature comes in because in new york state the legislature not the governor is the, is the head over i'll use the term overseers when it comes to education so the question is not necessarily only about our standards, but how do we get it into law, right? How do we get it into law? So, so there are conversations that are happening, but you know, we're somewhat in the beginning of that. Now, Dr. Young, being the chancellor of the regents, doesn't have autonomy as a single individual to make these things happen. And that's why it's important for us to show up when it comes to these meetings at the Board of Regents so we can advocate uh, for that. we know that there are fearless leaders in the room and when you are fearless you do get a target on your back and um, it becomes a, a a media storm but the question is is there a way to engage with the media that once the media storm is over that they then run a story to say okay now this is the good that's happened with this particular um leader because once it's there it's there for po posterity and it's very difficult for those leaders who do have that media coverage to come from under the shadow of, of a story that was um, had garnered so much attention, but now the media is not doing their due diligence to now undo what was um, exciting. Every city across this country, you have a, a paper that's notorious for writing bad stories. And so the strategy that I, that I use with the New York Post, because that's the paper I'm speaking about, is uh, there was a writer by the name of Go Govin, Jovin Goen, and uh, he was vicious when he wrote his stories. And so what I, what I did was I reached out to him before anything happened. And I actually asked him, I said, would you be willing to come visit my school? 
Uh, in order for me to do that, you know, I played by the rules this time because I don't always play by the rules, but this time I did. I reached out to the press office and I said, I want to invite this reporter to the school. And they said, are you sure you want to do this? And I said, absolutely. And, and so they said, okay, you know, you're a veteran. We'll, you could do what you want to do with that. So I invited him to my school. And, and the only thing I said to him was that you, you, can, you have to give me your word that you will only report what you see. In other words, don't make anything up because some reporters do that, right? I said, whatever you see, that's what you can write about. So the door, you can, I don't care if it's, if it's a, a great thing, write it. If it's a fight, write it. I don't care what you write. You can, you can even walk around with another staff person. You don't have to walk around with me. So this person came to the school and he, we walked the building and he said to me, um, he's, and by the way, when the bell rang, and, and I know how this is for some of us, I, I said to him, oh, let's hurry up and get in the hallway because the bell's about to ring. So we were on the fourth floor and I, the bell rang, we're standing in the hallway and <coughs> children do what they do. Um, and what they were saying was, hey, Gasaway, how you doing? You know, because this was it. my being in the hallway was not unfamiliar to them. So he's he's watching all this. And he said to me, is this the way it is all the time in your school? Because it was very calm. It was a very calm day. He said, is this the way it is in, always in your school? I said, absolutely not. I said, I said, there are days where there are issues that happen. There may be a fight that may break out. I said, if that happens, you simply deal with it and then you keep it moving. Do you know this man never wrote a negative story about the school when I was there, even though there were probably opportunities for him to do so? But because we had established that relationship, um, you know, he never he never wrote a negative story about about the school. And before that, he was writing them frequently, you know, frequently. And so I think just being open and to say, look, come see what see what we're doing, the good, the bad, and the ugly. And in fact, if there's some way that you can help. Maybe you can help us uh, with something. And so I've always had a very good relationship with the local papers. You know, national is a different story, but you want to have a, a good relationship with local. And the only way you can do that is by inviting people in. And, uh, and even say to them, look, you, we have a journalism program or we have an English class. Would you be willing to come in and, and uh, maybe just teach a class one day you know, so that the students can learn about your career? Um, this is ways to endear them to your school community um, and also to establish some level of trust. 